day it always is, the first day of the week, to assemble as the family of God, uh, to be with each other, and to worship God our Father. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. If you'd like to read along in your Bibles, we'll begin there in verse 21 in just a moment to cover this paragraph that we introduced last week. Before we do that, though, we want to uh, mention quickly about our summer series. Matt mentioned it. We'll just remind ourselves quickly. Brother Mike Greganis will be here with us at 6. Be sure that you do not miss him. That'll be the highlight of the night to spend time with Mike and to walk through that study of Joseph from the book of Genesis. We'll also have plenty to do after we dismiss. So make your plans. Stay, and we'll stay until dark enough to shoot fireworks and have a wonderful time together that night. Let's be sure that our faces are familiar to one another and that we create new memories in the Lord and our time together. Look forward to seeing you this coming Tuesday at 6. Now, last week we opened up our series studying this paragraph. We're calling it Blessed Assurance, and we sang that song, Blessed Assurance. Let's do something similar. Let's sing a song, and let's sing the second verse of It Is Well. We have introduction this morning. So verse 2. So we sing about it, but do we know the depth of the assurance God gives to us in Christ? And do we live out of that assurance he gives us in Christ? Do we make decisions, and not just decisions, but do we make every decision out of the assurance he gives us in Christ. Paul's on a, a trajectory of moving from elevating Christ, that's chapter 1, 15 through 20, into trying to get to some specific needs for the Colossians. That begins in chapter 2 and verse 6. But in order to do that, he first shows his own qualifications as to why he's writing to them. As we discussed last week, he is so qualified to write to them because he is suffering and has suffered in the likeness of Christ. Not to the degree of Christ, he's growing up into that suffering. But then he moves and says, listen, this is why as a suffering minister I'm writing to you, it's for your assurance sake. And when he writes about them having assurance, full confidence, it's for the sake of their stability. He's concerned about all the other forces and false messages and temptations that could knock them off of the perch they're established on. And so he writes. He writes knowing they're saved. But he also writes concerned they may not remain saved in the Lord and in Christ. So let's read this entire paragraph together. We'll begin in verse 21. Notice as we read these first couple of verses echo the thought we just sang from the second verse of it is well with my soul, that we live out of that assurance because of the price Christ has paid. So Colossians 1, beginning in verse 21. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions 
for the sake of his body, which, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this, in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So here's Paul writing and saying, I know that I've not been there before. But here is why I'm writing. It's out of my suffering, and it's for your assurance. If we think about how Paul might would write to us today, 2,000 years removed, and he would look at some of the things swirling around us, the thinking, the false teaching, the propaganda, wouldn't he have some of the same concerns? I'm writing to you because you are saved, but concerned that some of the things around you might cause you to shift from what you do enjoy in Christ. So look quickly at verse 21 that we opened with. Or 22 and 23 actually. One more. He has now, so 22, he has now reconciled in his body. That's a present day thing. Or really something Christ did in the past that we now enjoy today. He has done it. But the end of the verse, 22, that in order that he might present you Blameless, holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. He's pointing to a future reality at the end of verse 22. Do you see it? Christ has reconciled you. He is pointing forward to a day when you, you will be presented before him in holiness, blamelessness, and above reproach, above accusation. So we see a past and a future. But what is in between? Past salvation, longing for future glory. But what will happen in between? Look at verse 23. If, if, if indeed you continue, that indeed is emphatic, if indeed you continue in the faith. This brings up something very important for our study of blessed assurance. Assurance is a precious, valuable thing. We cannot put a cost on what our assurance is. But it is not automatic that we remain there. It's not true that once God saves, we no longer have to do anything, that we're always saved. He has saved, and he has saved us completely when we obey him. But we do not anticipate that future glory without maintaining and remaining and continuing in that salvation he has given. And so we see that laid out beginning in verse 23. What Paul does is he uses a metaphor, almost goes like a parable for us. To be able to see exactly how significant this is. See, Paul could have been simple and concise and said, you need to stay faithful. I'm writing to you so that you will remain faithful no matter what, and then listed the things they needed to do. He could have said, I'm writing to you so that you will be this sound church. And so here's what you do to be a sound church. But instead, Paul, multiple times in this paragraph, appeals to terms that deal with building and being built up. You see it in verse 23, right? If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope. All three of those are building terms, and they're all participles, right? Which means they're both verbs and adjectives, or verbs and nouns. The first two actually point to something that was done in the past that continues. 
So having been made stable, having been made established, see that's parallel to what happened in verse 22. He has now reconciled. So I'm writing to you because you are saved. God has made you stable and established. God is allowing you to be and causing you to be steadfast. So if you indeed continue and remain in that faith, a faith that God made you stable and established in when you obeyed, and then he shifts the tense for the next one, the last one, the third of these, not shifting. God saved you this way, but with the goal that you continue to not shift. And remember the background of this book. You've got these false teachers coming in and saying, you don't really know everything you need to know. You need to know more about mystical things and angels. You need new laws. Paul's saying you can't shift. You can't allow all of those teachings, all of those things to bombard you in such a way that you become unstable in what you've already heard and obeyed, not shifting of the gospel, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. And then he moves on to the close of this paragraph, chapter 2 of verse 5. Listen to this psychology. This is fantastic. He says, I rejoice. I've not seen you in person, but I still rejoice to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Good order could also mean well-regulated. It's, it's full. It's got everything necessary. The moving parts are all in place. Everything that's needed is provided. And I see you're firm. So what's he doing? By praising and rejoicing over something they are doing right, He's showing them how valuable it is. Now, he's concerned about their future, but he's also not saying you lack it completely. He's saying God saved you. And you as the church in Colossae, you've already begun. You already have this good order, this structure, this firmness. And that thrills my soul. I rejoice to see these things being lived out among you as the church in Colossae. And so he's showing them this is valuable. Thus, it is worth holding on to and remaining within. And then verse 7. Verse 6, as you receive Christ, so walk in him. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. There again, three different descriptions of how we are to keep walking. Rooted, the idea that our, our system goes down, our structure goes down. You've got pillars that extend into the earth that are anchoring us but also built up their stability, their structure that will last. And he says you're established in the faith just as you were taught. So you see this full picture. You are established. You are saved. And the goal is to get you to Christ mature if you continue, if you stay, if you remain. Several weeks ago when I was studying through this, I couldn't help but think Matthew 7 that we read for our scripture reading. It's inescapable. Jesus closes his Sermon on the Mount with that same exact word picture. You've heard this exposition about what life is going to be like in the new kingdom. So now here's the test. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on a rock. Same formula a few verses later. Everyone then who hears, you still hear, hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And he's pointing forward to that judgment day when all will face, quote, the storm, the same winds, the same waves, the same rains. But only the one who did, only the one who was established, established in the truth of Jesus, is the one that will withstand and that's the picture that Paul is painting for these Christians in this paragraph. I see you. I hear of you. And it thrills my soul. But it concerns me if you do not remain in what you've heard and obeyed. Jesus would also talk about a building that fell. Luke chapter 13, verse 4. There was a tower in Siloam there in Jerusalem that would fall and would kill 18 people. And he made two points by referencing that tragic event. He said, number one, those people were not worse sinners than the rest who live in Jerusalem. Then he said, number two, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Until you shift your thinking to change and to live like I'm teaching, 
you will suffer the spiritual fate that matches how they perished and died physically. So now we're sitting here and we're thinking about buildings and buildings that are built wrongly and buildings that are built on the wrong things and how they collapse and how they fall and how it's tragic. And as Matt mentioned, we've got this news story that's dominating our hearts and our minds. It's so heartbreaking. And so this morning, our first response is, let's be sure we're prayerful and sympathetic and that we pray and hope that if there's still a chance for someone to be alive somehow, they can find them and get to them. We also extend our love to those who have lost loved ones in this tragedy. But perhaps as we study this text in Colossians, where Paul lays out this building analogy, we're reminded of the high cost of building and living with assured stability. Clearly Jesus you know, uses that made-up story of the rich, rich, uh, wise man and the foolish man to make a spiritual point. He gives a common day occurrence. But just put yourself in the shoes of any foolish man who builds wrongly on sand. He thinks it's stable enough. Well, this, this will be enough. I'll add a little bit extra just to be sure it's enough, but maybe this will be stable enough. Maybe there are signs that it's cracking, that it's leaking, that it's shifting, but he still thinks, oh, I'm sure it's good enough. Until it's not enough. Hundreds of people went to bed on a Wednesday night not knowing they were living in an unstable environment. They just went about life. And they realized they were in an unstable environment when it came crashing down. And unfortunately, not pointing fingers, it's not our place to do any of that, but just hearing the reports that are swirling, there are dozens probably of people who knew the building had some issues. What were those people thinking in the weeks and the months and the years leading up to this? Oh, there's some problems, there's some warnings, some red flags, but surely it's stable enough. It's still a big building. It's still done right to begin with 40 years ago. It'll hold. It's good enough. And how did their priorities change when they awoke early Thursday morning to hear the news? What they thought was stable enough was not stable enough. You see Paul's concern about our souls? What we could convince ourselves is stable enough. Might not be stable enough for the threats that are around us. It might not be stable enough at judgment. So Paul says, you've got to be sure to know that God has saved you and thus he gives you everything you need to keep growing in that assurance. So that you're not just left to think and reason, I hope this is enough. You can live out of that assurance before him. And here's how we do that. Here's how we, he ties all this together. And this is the key idea for this morning. Let's, let's set this metaphor to get us woke up to how big a deal this is. But what does he say, how does he say it happens? Well, it's connected to our understanding. The key verse of chapter 2 and verse 2, it's Paul's goal that we reach the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. He says, I want you to have assurance, maturity, he says in chapter 1 and verse 28. Where does that come from? It comes only when we grow in understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. And this is continuing a theme that's run throughout this entire paragraph. We reference chapter 1 and verse 23 to begin with, this building imagery stuff. Look at the end of that verse. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. Which gospel? The gospel you heard. So you've already obeyed it. You already know it. Don't shift from what you've already received. Which, which gospel? So we're not to shift from. Well, the, the gospel has been preached and proclaimed throughout all creation. It hasn't changed. It's not going to change. It's the same all around the world, no matter where it's been preached. Don't shift and change from that gospel. And third, it's the gospel which Paul is the minister of, he says. So don't shift because the message does not change. Grow instead in your understanding. This entire paragraph that begins, or subparagraph that begins in verse 25, you'll notice Paul zooms in on his own mission, his own ministry. And he says his mission is to make the word of God fulfilled or fully known. Well, how does he then describe it? Verse 26. It's the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known 
how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory, notice, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What do we learn about the mystery in those verses? Three things. The mystery was hidden. Where, where, when was it hidden? When was it secured? When was it placed? Before. Before ages and generations. And now it's been revealed. It was unknown, now it's known. Number two, what's the mystery? It's that Gentiles get to enjoy the same salvation as the Jews. You see that reference in verse 27. How great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory. See, God doesn't have a select people that he only locks in on for all time. No, he, through Christ, opens this up to all the world. Doesn't matter who hears the gospel, the gospel is going to be the same. So they, with a Gentile background, most of them, could know this is the same message that now saves Jew and Gentile alike. Number three truth about the mystery is the mystery is Christ. See that at the end of verse 27? Which is Christ in you. It's not merely a message. It's the message about a person. It's about the message of Christ. The Christ he elevated in the previous section, chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. He holds all things together and he is this saving message and he is this sustaining message that will continue to stabilize you even deeper until judgment day. The mystery is Christ. So grow in that knowledge of Christ. You see verse 28? It's Christ we preach, Christ we proclaim, we warn, we teach with all wisdom so that we can present everyone mature before Christ. We cannot and will not stand mature before Christ without the influence of the preaching, the teaching, the learning of Christ constantly into our lives. If our goal is like that at the end of verse 28, to present everyone, be mature in Christ, if the goal is to be like one in verse 22, holy and blameless and above reproach, if those are the goals of our children, do we see? It will not happen without Christ, without us learning more deeply in our understanding and our knowledge of Christ. You go to chapter 2, this key verse, verse 2. What is it? It's the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. There it is again. Mystery is Christ. Look at verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Think about this puzzle he's put together. He said the mystery was hidden. It was set aside before the ages and generations. But now all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. We can find everything we need in one place. Deeper understanding, deeper knowledge of Christ. Then look at verses 6 and 7 when it begins to get practical in the book. As you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Verse 7, we already referenced, but established what? Established in the faith, just as you were taught. It's all about understanding, understanding the knowledge you've received. Keep growing in that same source so that you will be stable to fend off any threat against your soul. Now, to illustrate quickly what understanding might look like, let's not go to a fallen condo. Let's go just to any general condo, any high-rise building. Think of all of the hundreds of people involved in that building process. Dozens are laying out the blueprints and figuring out what's going to bear the weight and how much is needed to support the weight and how much weight that creates. I mean, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds on that part of the process itself. Then there's a permit process. You have officials who try to come in and say, this meets the code. This can withstand the elements. This meets our approval for being able to be built. Then you've got people who finance that operation. You've got people who bring in the elements, the supplies, the resources that are going to be needed to build this with. Then you've got hundreds of people who will come in and build that building. And they're out there in the hot sun, and they're out there in the elements, and they're out there long days for a long time to put this thing together. Hundreds of people involved just to get this off the ground. Now, out of all those hundreds of people, how many of them would we say have complete, full understanding of the project? Maybe, on one hand, five people. 
Paul is saying, listen, you've got all of these things that are swirling about you. You've got all these things in creation and in recreation when it comes to your souls. And you need to be sure you're clinging to the one who knows it all and understands it all. Remember, that's the paragraph, chapter 1, 15 through 20. He holds creation together. He holds recreation together. So now, you keep growing in your relationship to him, your assurance in the understanding he has of all the things. Listen, we are bombarded daily with different temptations and different modes of temptation and different false messages and the internet Technology makes those messages even more accessible. We will not withstand them without growing and deepening in our assurance of understanding in Christ. It will not happen. The warning signs are clear. So that's why Paul writes to them, knowing they face similar struggles and we face those today. Grow, deepen yourself in your understanding of Christ so that you do not lose the stability of he gives. And so we might ask the question, how do we do that? How do, how do we go about doing that? And this, this question will challenge us, I think, to move in the proper direction. Do we understand everything that we already know? See, Paul's not saying don't learn anything new, okay? We need to keep learning new things from the text of Scripture, from God himself, things that we don't know or things that we have not re remembered or do not recall. But if we just put a peg on what we know already, do we understand everything that we know in the light of Christ? That means we have much growth that can still happen because we need to keep growing and understanding and then applying what he has given and what we have obeyed already. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul would tell Timothy, Think on what I have said to you, and the Lord will give you understanding. Think on what I say to you and the Lord will give you understanding. You see the difference? Paul is saying here's what I've told you. You need to do it but you need to also think about it. Dwell on it. Meditate on it. Ask questions of God. Ask questions of the scriptures and keep going back to the scriptures most importantly to allow God and the scriptures to answer those questions. Pray. Ask well think about and the Lord will bless you with understanding two things from the text of Colossians 1 and 2 that will help us to grow in our understanding number one think go back not find new think go back not find new what's the, what's going to unlock our stability it's not constantly finding new things that we never knew existed before out there in the realm of society it's always going back to what God has given us it's always to go back you see in the text it's what you heard it's what you were taught that was important for the Colossians because they come along with this new progressive message and Paul says, hold up. The message you heard and were taught, it predates creation itself. You go back to that message. So we need the same reminder today. Just because someone comes along with something that sounds new and sounds fresh and sounds relevant, it might, it might even have some things about God and Jesus in it. We go back to the text of Scripture. We go back to what we heard in the Gospel to see what it is that we should know and understand. But number two, we zoom in on chapter 2 and verse 6. We be sure we complete the circuit. Whatever text we're just studying or whatever topic we're studying, whatever reading we're doing, we want to do our best to connect Christ to action. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So whatever text, whatever question we have, how does this relate? How does God say this is important to salvation in Christ? And then how am I moving that toward an application? How will this change my life? How will this change what I do within a given day? How will this change and improve an answer I give when I'm asked this question? How will this improve my relationships? How will this improve my holiness? Always think, how can I connect to Christ from the scriptures and then move toward the actions he would have me to do from the scriptures. Super millionaire investor Warren Buffett was standing before some college students and he said, you need to understand the importance of your body. He's 90 years old now and he credits a lot of his success to taking care of his body. So he was trying to make this impression upon them and he said, let's suppose for a minute that I bought you a car 
I'll buy you any car you want. Oh, college kid, perk up. Any car I want. He said, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll make sure it arrives first thing outside your door in the morning, and I'll put a big red bow on it. It'll be the greatest thing you can imagine. Whatever you want, the model, the package, you tell me. But here is the catch. It's the only car you'll ever be able to have for the rest of your life. Does that catch change how a college student might pick out what car it is? How they take care of it, where they store it, what they do with it? How they maintain it? Do we fully recognize God has given us one life, one soul? Will we choose to submit with that life, with that soul, to Christ, to his teachings, to build it in the right place, in the right way, on the rock, to keep driving down deep into the assurance he gives so that we remain stable throughout all threats against us. The good news is we can begin at any time. So even if you're 90 and you never called him Lord, today that can change. If you have not obeyed the gospel, you can change that today. You can begin building that life in him. If you need to put him on in baptism where he saves, let today be the day that you choose to put him on. If you have made that decision before and you know that you've not lived in a way that's stable and secure in his assurance, you can come back to him and he promises to forgive. He promises to help strengthen you, to be more like him, to reflect the glory of his son in all things. Know that we stand here ready to help you out of the love of God for you. Would you come and come now as we sing?